Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom is the most visited theme park on the planet, receiving over 17 million visitors in 2022. It has held the record for 16 years in a row. It is pretty much the theme park of theme parks. It opened its doors in 1971, 16 years after Disney opened its original park, Disneyland, in Anaheim, California. This park was based off of that same design, with that hub and spokes layout in six core themed lands. That can be broken up into Main Street USA, Tomorrowland, Fantasyland, Liberty Square, Adventureland, and Frontierland. The Walt Disney Company certainly learned a lot with the original Disneyland. This park was designed much more with capacity in mind. You'll notice the pathways are a lot wider. There's overall less attractions. But that's also because we're dealing with four parks here where the Disneyland Resort has two. So they have a lot less space, which is something that Disney World really has no shortage of. I first visited Magic Kingdom back in 2011. I was in the seventh grade. It was my second ever Disney park after Disneyland, which I had visited when I was real young. I've since gone back many, many times, and it has certainly been interesting to see how my overall opinion of this park has evolved. I think to be honest, my original view of this park was largely negative. And I think part of that comes from the stereotype that this is a kid's park. And so as I got older, I immediately brushed aside Magic Kingdom. You know, there's so many theme parks in the Orlando area. Why would I want to go to Magic Kingdom? Especially coming from the perspective of someone that did not grow up watching the classic Disney animated cartoons. I didn't connect with any of these characters. There wasn't a whole lot of interest for me in the Magic Kingdom. And the park just seems so stereotypical. Typical, you know? Yes, it was insanely innovative at the time, but now Magic Kingdom is kind of seen as like basic. And so the other parks just seem so much more interesting to me. However, this funny little thing happened in the summer 2017. At the D23 Expo, Tron Light Cycle Run was announced for the Magic Kingdom. As someone that's very into roller coasters, finally it felt like Magic Kingdom was getting a ride that was designed for me. So I'd follow along with construction of this attraction that just seems so cool and interesting. And so I'd gradually spend more and more time at Magic Kingdom becoming a pass holder, experiencing all the little nooks and crannies with Magic Kingdom. And suddenly, here we are in 2024, I feel like I can really appreciate Magic Kingdom as a theme park. It is still not my favorite, and it absolutely has its flaws, which I'm going to get into later in this video. But I will at least start off by saying that my initial impressions of this park were a little harsh. I think I was quick to judge, and if you find yourself in a similar situation, Situation, I encourage you to give this park a chance and maybe you'll have a similar reaction as I will. But I know for a large amount of people, they don't need to give this park a chance because they already love it. There's a reason that Magic Kingdom is like the go-to when families are looking to take a vacation. Everyone at some point in their life takes a trip to Florida to visit Disney World. It's because they really strive to achieve that goal of being the most magical place on earth. And when I say that this park was designed with precision in mind, every inch was so meticulously thought out. Maybe nowhere else on earth is there a place that has sight lines so perfectly crafted like Magic Kingdom. Their goal is to just perfectly immerse you in this world and they're extremely meticulous about it. The entirety of Magic Kingdom is located on the second floor. Underneath is a series of tunnels called the Utilidors, allowing cast members to travel between lands. That way they don't break the continuity of looking out of place. That's why you never see a cast member wearing a Tomorrowland uniform in Fantasyland. That's like next level stuff. So let's walk through this park experience, starting first off with how you even get here. Well, Magic Kingdom is set up a little different than the other Disney parks. The Imagineers really wanted to make it a true journey. It's an experience in itself just getting to Magic Kingdom, and Walt was fascinated with transportation. So you're actually going to park about a mile away from Magic Kingdom, take a tram to the Transportation Ticket Center. This is when you can board a monorail, which will take you around the Seven Seas Lagoon, or you can ride a ferry across the water straight to the park. If you're coming from a resort or one of the other Disney parks, Parks, you can bypass the transportation ticket center by taking a bus. They'll drop you off essentially at the front entrance of the park. Or if you're staying at the Contemporary, Polynesian, or Grand Floridian, you can just take the monorail. It does add to the anticipation just looking out the window and seeing the park skyline, but it also does make it kind of an ordeal and something that you really have to factor in when planning out your time. Don't be surprised if it takes you half an hour to get from your car to the park entrance. Visiting Magic Kingdom is a time commitment. But for what it is, it is neat, and it is very impressive how many people they're able to pack onto these monorails. Be prepared, it can get very crowded, especially if you're boarding the monorail right after the fireworks. Now, when you arrive at Magic Kingdom, when you're greeted with your front entrance, we have your classic train depot. Again, inspired by the original Disneyland entrance, you can see the train pulling up. That train goes all the way around the park. There are three stops, one at the front, there's another in Frontierland, and then Storybook Circus. This immediate front entry plaza of Magic Kingdom is called Town 
Town Square. It then dumps you out onto Main Street, USA. All of this is designed to look like an early 20th century American town, specifically inspired by Walt's hometown in Missouri. So many of these buildings are based around classic businesses, such as a fire station. There's a barber shop where you can actually get a haircut in the Magic Kingdom. There's a town hall that's home to guest services. There's a candy shop, a coffee shop. It's actually just Starbucks, but it's disguised. They're immersive like that. The entire left side of Main Street USA is one big emporium. Biggest shop you've ever seen. All the windows on Main Street have fun little displays with like little figurines featuring simple movement. Just helps keep that kinetic energy up. All of Main Street USA was designed with forced perspective in mind. The second and third levels of these buildings just get progressively smaller to make you think that they're actually taller than they are. The same is done for Cinderella's Castle, which is of course your centerpiece. From that plaza, you'll find a bridge that'll take you into each of the separate lands. It makes it very convenient to get from one side of the park to the other. It's an absolutely brilliant layout because because there's very few dead ends. It's pretty much just by Big Thunder and I guess Storybook Circus. But even that technically connects to Tron, so it's really not that bad. But even the way that the Imagineers are talking about the Big Thunder area, it seems like they want to expand back there and eventually complete the loop so that that's no longer a dead end. It'll be really cool to see what they eventually come up with when it opens in like 20 years. You know, they're a little slow around here. But at least getting back to the hub, I love how wide open this space is. There's so many places for you to sit, relax. You can often find live entertainment during the day, such as a marching band or barbershop court. Tet. Magic Kingdom is a very popular spot for high school marching bands. So as you're walking around the park, there's a very good chance that you'll see characters or people out performing in some way, shape, or form. There are designated spaces for individual character meet and greets. Be warned, they can get quite a line. But there are plenty of characters. They'll just be hanging out in little areas you can just walk right up to. But I'd say the vibe around this area is just very pristine. Everything's extremely clean and well kept. There's always classic music playing here from like the Oklahoma soundtrack or the Music Man. A lot of photo ups, everyone trying to get their picture in front of the castle, which I mean, I don't blame them. This castle is so iconic. It stands 199 feet in the air. They put it just below 200 so they don't have to put an air traffic control light at the very top. A few years ago, the castle was repainted from this white and blue color scheme to now pink and blue. In my opinion, it looks a lot better now. It's not my favorite of the Disney castles. It's definitely better than Disneyland's. Paris's is still my favorite, but I look forward to seeing Hong Kong and Shanghai's eventually. So let's move counterclockwise around the park. I want to start with Tomorrowland. And this is a really interesting one because there's an inherent problem with Tomorrowland. When you theme a land to the future, you're designing a land based around what you think the future will look like, and then eventually that day will come, and now there'll be a new vision of what the future will look like. So suddenly, an area based around tomorrow will feel like yesterday. So how do you get around that issue? Well, Tomorrowland is themed around what people in the 50s thought the future would look like. Suddenly, that makes this area feel like charmingly retro, and having experienced other Tomorrowlands at the other Disney parks, I would actually say this one is probably the best. We do have some of the most popular rides in the park in this section. This is the original Space Mountain. There's two sides, Alpha and Omega. If you can only ride one, Omega side is better. There's actually airtime, trust me. The ride is janky, but that's part of the fun of it. The People Mover is a huge crowd pleaser, almost never a line. Something that you can just walk on and actually stay on. If when you hit the end of the ride and you don't want to get up, you can just ask to stay on and you can just keep going around all day. Gives you some great views of the land, even goes through Space Mountain, which is really cool. Carousel of Progress is a rotating theater show, another attraction that most of the time you can just walk on. It's a long experience featuring several animatronics taking you through time. In my opinion, this is one of those one and dones, but I know it does have its fans. The Tomorrowland Speedway is a kids like antique car style attraction. Again, kind of one of those one and dones in my opinion. I've done a lot of antique car rides around the world, and this is probably one of my least favorite. If you have to prioritize what attractions to do at Magic Kingdom, I would say skip this one. Tron Light Cycle Run is the fastest ride in the park. It's also their newest. It's a state-of-the-art thrill ride from Vacoma. You ride on a light cycle. You get launched out underneath this amazing canopy and straight into the show building filled with some brilliant effects. There's already a full separate review of Tron on this channel. Please go check it out if you want to hear about that ride specifically. Also in this land is Astro Orbiter, Monsters Inc. Laugh Floor, Buzz Lightyear, Astro Blasters, your typical like shooting dark ride. One of the many attractions in the park that does not have a height requirement. Anyone can do it. The signature food location in Tomorrowland is Cosmic Gray's, literally one of the busiest restaurants in the world. Also home to what is, in my opinion, some of the most basic food offerings. Magic Kingdom, I think, can be kind of a hit or miss when it comes to food. Some places are better than others. There's a lot of expensive sit-down restaurants that require reservations, but there's also no shortage of quick service. None of it is cheap. 
But I will say that I have been to parks that charge more for chicken tenders and pizza than Magic Kingdom. So it could be worse. I'll mention some of my favorite food places as we continue on. I want to transfer from Tomorrowland over to Fantasyland. This is probably the biggest land in the park. There is so much to see and do here, and it's really broken up into several different mini lands. Like literally right next to Tomorrowland is Storybook Circus. This was a replacement for Mickey's Toontown. They closed that to make way for a new Fantasyland, which was this big old expansion. It's why this land is so huge. So this was like a new subsection, which included a relocated Dumbo attraction, a rethemed Barnstormer, which is the kids coaster here. Yes, it's tame, but it only goes two miles per hour slower than Space Mountain. So just think about that next time you're riding it. Overall, this is an odd area in my opinion. I feel like Mickey's Toontown at Disneyland is a much better fit. I know this is really designed for like the young, young kids, but it's a section of this park that I always forget exists, not an area I ever choose to go in. Again, I'm aware I'm not the target audience, but the overall theme of this land is just a little strange in my opinion. I feel like they should have gone with something different. Some other subsections of Fantasyland include this area by Ariel's Undersea Adventure. This is a clone of the same attraction at Disney's California Adventure, except this one has a much better queue. It is like absolutely beautiful, so intricate. This rock work is stunning. And the ride is also usually one that doesn't get a long wait, so you can typically walk on it. So many animatronics in there, it's really cool. My only complaint is it feels like there needs to be an extra scene at the end to explain what happened to Ursula. It's a little bizarre that right after our animatronic, it just disappears and it's like, oh, yep, that's the end. So I personally to fix that, but it's still fun. Next door is a mini land themed around Beauty and the Beast. You have Gaston's Tavern and probably the signature restaurant of the park, Be Our Guest, one that can definitely be hard to get a reservation for and is very expensive once you're in, but the interior is beautiful. It's nice that this is here, but I can't help but feel like Beauty and the Beast really deserves a ride back in this section. Tokyo Disneyland has a stunning trackless dark ride that just would be a perfect fit back here. I think if I could add anything to Magic Kingdom, that would probably be my top pick. As you're exiting that mini land, you'll probably notice off to the side is Seven Dwarves Mine Train. This was like the ride of that new Fantasyland expansion. It's got some very pretty theming and a cute little indoor section. It is absolutely a short ride. So the biggest tip I could give for this thing is don't wait in the really long line that it'll get. Because it is very common for this to be the longest wait in the park. Love it or hate it, if you're going to get a lightning lane for anything, I'd say this is probably the one to do. The first time I rode this, I spent almost three hours in line for it and I was just really mad at after getting off the ride, because I was like, that was it? Like the ride itself is fine. It's tamer than Big Thunder Mountain. And it has these swinging vehicles, which is kind of fun. You can rock them back and forth. But as like a roller coaster, there's not much to it. Right across from Seven Dwarves is Winnie the Pooh. This was actually a reskin of Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. And I've had the opportunity of doing the ones at Disneyland as well as Tokyo Disneyland. And I think of those three, this one is my least favorite, which actually isn't too surprising. It is the oldest of them. The others were built from the ground up, so they had more space to work with and could really go all out. But it's not like there's anything inherently wrong with it. I mean, kids are still going to love it. By now, as you continue around, you're going to be directly behind Cinderella's castle. There's Prince Charming's Royal Carousel. Directly in front of it is the Sword in the Stone, which is a nice touch. The main quick service restaurant in this area is Pinocchio's Village House, which serves like flatbread pizzas. They're fine, not anything too crazy, but it does have this nice window overview of Small World. This is one of the two attractions in this section of Fantasyland that has this like medieval fair or like carnival vibe. This is one of those classic like old school Disney dark rides with lots of creepy dolls and that kind of annoying song just playing on repeat. It's definitely one of those love it or hate it attractions. Peter Pan's flight is directly across the way. This is another one of those attractions that you're going to want to beware of the line that it gets. It's a lower capacity attraction that even though it has a continuous loading platform, it can really only seat like two or three guests at a time. So if you're going to shell out for a lightning lane for anything, this is also not a bad option at all. It's a nice retelling of the animated cartoon of Peter Pan. Really cool ride system where you're suspended looking down at the set pieces. There's no words throughout the entire attraction. The story's just told through music and visuals. Shorter ride, definitely more enjoyable if you don't have to wait for it. And finally, to end out Fantasyland, we have one more princess to acknowledge, and I'm not gonna lie, she got a pretty crappy situation here, if you know what I mean. It's Rapunzel and the Tangled Bathrooms. Guys, she deserves better. Like, don't get me wrong, these bathrooms are really nice, but really? In Magic Kingdom, this is all she's got? Some toilets? Give her a ride, like the new one going to Fantasy Springs at Tokyo Disney Sea. That's gonna be awesome. So let's head from Fantasyland into Liberty Square. This is probably the smallest of the core lands in Magic Kingdom. It's also the only one that is unique to Magic Kingdom. It essentially replaced the New Orleans Square that was at Disneyland. It's a colonial town set during the American Revolution. You can see the Liberty Bell. Above is this tree paying tribute to the 13 original colonies with these lanterns. You have the Hall of Presidents. There's a great quick service place that serves chicken and waffles 
meals, and at the Columbia Harbor House, you can get a full lobster roll or a New England shrimp boil. I'd like you to try and find another park that serves something like that. From Liberty Square, that's also where you can access the Rivers of America and hop on the Liberty Bell Showboat. They'll take you around the waterways, give you some nice views. The signature attraction here is Haunted Mansion. And this has always been a fan favorite. Of course, patterned after the original at Disneyland, this one has a much more intimidating facade. Although personally, I prefer the exterior of Disneyland's. But the show scenes here are just so well done. It's so creepy and cool in there. No visit to Magic Kingdom is complete without riding Haunted Mansion. So let's head into Frontierland. This is of course themed after the old American West. So you have like cowboys, Native Americans, horses. There's a great quick service location called Pecos Bill. It's like a fajita and nacho bar. In terms of attractions, we have the Country Bear Jamboree, probably my least favorite in the park. I know it has its fans, but I am not one of them. As you keep going around, you'll get to Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Another one of those rides that like, yeah, you can't go to Magic Kingdom and just not experience this. Several different lift hills, real long ride, some great theming. Personally, of the Big Thunder Mountains that I've done. Paris's is still my favorite, but this one's not bad at all. Right next door is Tiana's Bayou Adventure, formerly Splash Mountain, and right across is the entrance to Tom Sawyer's Island. So this is where you climb aboard a raft and go out onto the rivers of America and are deposited right in the center. And let me just say, it's no secret the Magic Kingdom can get like disgustingly crowded. This is a perfect way to escape those crowds and just do some exploration. It's really an awesome hidden gem filled with some secret caves. There's this huge fort, great views of Big Thunder. Thunder, and most importantly, it's quiet back there. If you're feeling overwhelmed at all and need to escape, this is probably the top place I would recommend going. And finally, this brings us back around to Adventureland to complete the loop. And this is another pretty large area land-wise, also broken up into like different sections. Everything's inspired by like different cultures in Asia, Africa, South America. In the center of this land, we have the magic carpets of Aladdin. You can see the Arabian inspired tents next door. Right behind it is the enchanted tiki room. Everything's Polynesian. That's also where you can get a Dole Whip, which in my opinion is the best treat on property. I know everyone's always talking about the popcorn and the churros and Mickey bars, but let's be real, you can get those treats anywhere. The Dole Whip here at Disney World is the real deal. Freaking delicious. Do it. Some of the key attractions here include the Swiss Family Treehouse, another great exploration area that doesn't require you to wait in any line. Pirates of the Caribbean is one of the best rides in the park, famous around the world, featuring some incredible set pieces and tons of detailed animatronics. It's not my personal favorite of the pirates that I have experienced, but it's still really good. And finally, we have Jungle Cruise, which is just a good time. I know some people aren't a fan of it, but I think that the jokes that are told are just hilarious. I like that every time you ride it, you get a different person, so it's going to be a different experience. It always puts a smile on my face, and I also really like riding this ride at night. It's totally a vibe. And I found that the later you go when there's less kids around, there's a bit more jokes that like might be geared towards adults. Not saying it's raunchy or anything, but it's more things that adults would be able to appreciate that kids wouldn't necessarily get. So I quite enjoy it. So there you go, your Crash Course Magic Kingdom. I may not have covered everything, but I tried to at least highlight the most important parts of each land, and there's still a few things left that I want to cover. First off, the Nighttime Spectacular. Happily Ever After is the signature show that takes place every night. There's projections on the castle and fireworks for like 18 minutes straight. It's a fantastic show, but beware of the crowds. This is the most crowded Magic Kingdom will get all day, and it is kind of a nightmare. What happens is, not only is everyone trying to see the same show and get the exact same view, so the pathways are really congested, but also many of these pathways are blocked off, forcing everyone into this one central walkway, and it's like impossible to move. I would actually say it's even worse directly after the fireworks have ended and everyone's trying to get out and redisperse throughout the park. You're like shoulder to shoulder with people where you're going from this massive crowd filtered down into this one single line where everyone just kind of ends up standing around not being able to move. It is so bad. Like guys, it is very fitting that Magic Kingdom is right off of I-4 because neither one of them can handle the amount of traffic they receive and will result in extremely frustrating backups. Most of the time, Magic Kingdom has great traffic flow. The amount of pathways in this park is extremely helpful, but during fireworks time and anytime there's a big performance, that could be a marching band or one of the parades, everyone's just forced in this really tight area that makes navigation extremely annoying. So for that reason, visiting Magic Kingdom can be kind of a lot. It's easily to be overstimulated here and overwhelmed at the sheer amount of people. And the sad thing is there's not really any time of year you can go when it's going to be lighter crowds. There's not 
really an off season at Magic Kingdom anymore. It's just always busy. The only time where you can really get a break is if you go after the fireworks have ended for like the last two hours that the park is open. Magic Kingdom is typically open till like 11. That's the sweet spot when the pathways are a lot quieter, the wait times are lower, and there's also a lot less kids. So it feels less hectic. Like there's a couple guarantees when you go to Magic Kingdom. One of them is that you will get your foot crushed by a stroller at least two to three times throughout the day or you won't be able to get somewhere because there's too many strollers blocking it. There's just strollers everywhere. Which again, like when you go to the most visited park in the world that is like designed for kids and families, it's a given, like it's gonna happen. But boy, is it real nice when suddenly all those kids go to bed and you can have the park to yourself. I can safely say that I significantly prefer Magic Kingdom at night than during the day. I would borderline say that going to Magic Kingdom during the day is like too much. The crowds are too high, the lines are too long, which is unfortunate because if you're going here for your first time, it might not necessarily be that like magical experience that you hope to get because there's so much to do and you're either gonna have to wait in a long line over and over and over again, or or spend a lot more money to skip them with the lightning lanes. And I'll be honest, this park is really tough to do without lightning lane. Those wait times can be terrible. I'm not a huge fan of lightning lane. I think the old fast pass system did it better, but some of those standby lines are miserable that sometimes you don't feel like you have a choice. Like the only tip I can give is if you're not doing lightning lane at all and you're staying till close, do those rides with the longest lines at the very end. They might still be listed as a long wait, but at Disney, they do love to overestimate. If the wait time is listed at 15 minutes or less, it's probably a walk-on. If it's listed at a 30 minute wait it's probably only like 10 to 15. And to be honest, it stinks that like if you want to have a good time at this park, it feels like you have to do all this preparation, research into how this system works, come up with a plan for how you're going to conquer the day. Like any other theme park, you should just be able to show up to and have a good time. But if you're not prepared for Magic Kingdom, you're probably going to get screwed over and not get to do everything you want. There's a lot of things I like about Magic Kingdom. and I think they do really well, but I can certainly acknowledge that you kind of got to be in the right mindset for Magic Kingdom. Like you got to know what you're getting yourself into. And that's why I say this park is not for everyone especially if you are tight on a budget. We haven't even talked about prices, but if you want a one-day ticket to Magic Kingdom, you're going to be paying somewhere between $124 and $189, and that's not a park hopper, and those prices are going to go up. Disney raises their prices every year because there is so much demand. They can get away with it because people will still pay it. They might have to just spend more time saving up for that trip. I know people who plan this out for weeks, months, sometimes even years just to visit Disney World. Whatever it takes to create those new memories with their family in the most magical place on Earth. And sometimes I wonder if the overcomplication of boarding groups, lightning lanes, reservations, and overcrowding is enough to steer people away to go off and find better options. Because nearby competitors like Universal are really stepping it up. And it comes without the same hassle of going to Disney World. So I hope it's a bit of a wake-up call for Disney and that they'll do something about it because at the end of the day, people are here for vacation and no one wants to deal with that kind of stress while on a vacation. But the sad reality is when you go to Magic Kingdom, it's kind of inevitable. So let me know down in the comments below what have been your experiences at Magic Kingdom. Do you agree with the points that I brought up? Do you think there's anything I missed? Please post all that down below. And of course, stay tuned for more park reviews here at Coaster Studios and I'll see you next time.